Alrighty then. Welcome back to U.S. History. Oh my gosh, I just realized that I recorded my world history lecture just right before you guys, and I re just realized that I opened with saying, welcome back to U.S. History. So, hopefully they didn't stop watching. But, uh, welcome back to U.S. History, co um, um, quarantine style. Uh, so I'll let you guys know that I'm recording this at 6.44 p.m. on Monday the 30th. I do hope to have this lecture up by tonight. I mean, I, I should without a doubt, but certainly by tomorrow morning. Um, and I just want to let you kind of guys know what has happened this afternoon. This afternoon, Governor in Arizona, Governor Doug Ducey, extended a shelter-in-place restriction that was going to take effect tomorrow, Tuesday, the 31st at 5 p.m., I believe. 5 p.m., I think, 9 p.m., something like that. It's tomorrow evening. And um, so basically, you know, from that, it doesn't seem like a whole lot is going to change. Basically, so essentially, essential services. Boy, that was, those are some repetitive sentences there, at least repetitive words. Um, essential services must remain open, of course. So grocery stores, gas stations, doctor's offices, hospitals, banks, those kind of like always have to stay open. So those are not affected. Then there were some, there are some other things that are being closed. Like certainly they're just closing down all restaurants, all, you know, bars, that kind of thing. So one of the, one of the things that I don't know if you guys know about this, I saw a stat today in Maricopa County, which is the largest county in Arizona. It's one of the largest counties by land in the country. Um, 35% of the infected with coronavirus are between the ages of like 25 and 40. And it's like, why? But it's because so many people are still go our age. You know, your age, my age, you're a little bit younger than that generally. But still, I mean, you guys are still going out. Um, and you're still going, you know, congregating with group bigger groups of people and not really paying attention to these requests of, of self-isolation and um, social distancing. So... Um, the governor finally, I think it should have taken place two weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe even, but the governor has finally instituted this and, and there we go. So um, I, I do want to just say, I believe that I forgot to put a meme up for us on the last lecture, but um, I do want to show you, I, I actually found five. I found five, they're very short, but these are memes, tweets, and then an Insta post or a Facebook post. So here is day one of shelter in place and then there's day 15. Um, with the family. So, um, I just think it's kind of funny. Uh, it's actually a little sad, too, <laughs> when you think about it. By the way, the, the picture that's Jack Nicholson, um, or Jack Nicholas, Nicholson, Nicholson, um, that's from the movie The Shining. So, you've got time to watch that movie. Now, it's from the 70s. It's one of, you know, the most famous thrillers, you know, horror movies in American history, um, mo American movie history, certainly. Um, so I highly recommend you watching that if, if you've never seen it. Again, you've got the time. Um, so here's one told to shelter in place. Already in bed. Goes back to sleep. Um, I like to think that he is drinking root beer. He's also got such angry eyes. Like, that look, that's like such an angry look. It's kind of funny. Um, now would be a hilarious time to go on Yelp giving everyone zeros for stores. Uh, zero stars for being closed. Um, that's, that's me. I do not recommend it, but I did think that tweet was funny. And then the people who give out free hugs must be devastated right now. That is true. I've always found free hugs to be creepy. I've never accepted a free hug. I'm happy by myself. I'm also happy with not being touched. So I don't need any free hugs. But it is true. I, again, I think it's funny. And then finally, two guys walk into a bar. Nope. It's closed. Good. Finally. We have it all closed. So, um, ha, ha, ha. Here's what we got today. Um, what I like to do a couple times a semester, um, at least I like to do once, is I like to share a bunch of real life stories, um, kind of things that you don't get taught generally when you teach us, when you learn about a subject. And for the civil rights unit here, um, I thought this was the perfect time to add some short stories in. So I don't know what the clock will say. I don't know how long this was until it's finished. So you will know, but you can see though that it is a bit shorter, I'm sure. At least I assume so, because I've just got some short stories. Normally I would read these to you guys in person and then we'd discuss each of them afterwards, but we're, we're not going to do that. In fact, you don't even have any what say use. You need to just find the three um, secret words, and that will be your participation. Now, I will give you guys a little bit of a hint in terms I keep saying, like, ooh, you've got the time. Well, we do. We have, a lot, we have a lot more time on our hands. We still have a lot of work to do. We're so close, you guys, to being done. But we have a lot more work to do. 
And um, one of the things that I have been doing with the, with my little bit of free time, I haven't had a lot, honestly, but I bought about six months ago the PlayStation Mini. You guys know that I'm a bit of a gamer, that I love, I love playing video games. So I bought the PlayStation Mini a while back, but I bought it after I... After I had researched and found that it could be hacked to add more ROMs to it, so you can get more games on it. It comes with like 20 or 25. It has been sitting in a box. I know you can't see my hand, but it's been sitting in a box on the floor two feet from me. I mean, like, that's where it was sitting um, for the last six months. So finally, my son, Benjamin, who was like six years old, um, he's been like, when are you going to set this thing up, Daddy? And I'm like, I'll get to it when I get to it. And finally, I'm just making the point to get to it. So I'm adding all, all those ROMs, which um, got me thinking, like, oh, maybe my theme for this week could be video game based. So my three secret words for this week, for this lecture, is video game based. I'm not going to give you any greater hints than that, but you'll, you'll catch it. And then after you present the secret words, I just ask you for fun. So the presenting the secret words is the participation points. But then I then ask you for fun, what is the, um, what is the theme? So I always come up with a theme. Um, this one, I think, could be pretty easy. I can tell you that the last one was um, was pretty hard, the theme that I gave. It might, seem, it might seem kind of easy, but it's actually a really hard thing. Now, don't worry. You don't lose points if you get the theme wrong at all. That's just the fun part of it. But um, watch for our first lecture next week, and I will tell you what the themes were specifically after I've already locked your participation points. Which, by the way, remember, these must be turned in by Friday at midnight. I will not accept on Saturday or Sunday. If we have four, five days, and I'm going to get this, you know, a little over four days to get these lectures watched and listened to to get those secret words into my email inbox. And that is the last thing before we start. Um, I know I said in the very first lecture, send me a, a like a doc. You don't have to send me a word doc. Please just write the email with the secret words and just send it. It's a lot faster for me to grade. So if you don't mind, do not send for, for the what's use in the future. Again, we don't have any what's use today. But for the what's use in the future and for the secret words, don't send, me them in, send them to me in doc form. Send them to me in our IA. So if, you're, um, if your IA is Matthew Garcia or Kevin Miller, send it to us in just in straight up email. That's just a lot easier to get to. So all of that out of the way, here are our short stories. So this one is called Liars Don't Qualify. And I'll tell you what, all the pictures are on the right side, so I'm going to move me right there. How is that? All right, so this one is called Liars Don't Qualify. Will Harris sat on the bench in the waiting room for another hour. His pride was not the only thing that hurt. He wanted... Oops. Okay, we're good. Uh, it's just my screen. He wanted to call them and get him registered so he could get out of there. Twice he started to go into the inner office and tell them, but the thought better of it, but he thought better of it. He had counted 96 cigarette butts on the floor when a fat man came out of the office and spoke to him. What do you want, boy? Well, Harris got to his feet. I came to register. Oh, you did, did you? Yes, sir. The fat man stared at Will for a second, then turned his back to him. As he turned his back, he said, come on in here. Will went in. It was a little office and dirty, but not so dirty as the waiting room. There were no cigarette butts on the floor here. Instead, there was paper. They looked like candy wrappers to Will. There were two desks jammed there, and the bony little man sat at one of them, his head down, his fingers fumbling with his papers. The fat man went around the empty desk and pulled up a chair. The bony man did not look up. Will stood in front of the empty desk and watched the fat man sit down behind it. The fat man swung his chair around until his, he faced the little man. Charlie, he said. Yes, Sam, Charlie said, not looking up from his work. Charlie, this boy here says he's come to register. You sure? You sure that's what he said, Sam? Still not looking up. You sure? You'd better ask him again, that again, Sam. All right, Charlie, all right, I'll ask him again. The fat man said. He looked up at Will. Boy, what you come here for? I came to register. The fat man stared up at him. He didn't say anything. He just stared, his lips in a thin line, his eyes wide open. His left hand searched behind him and came up with the handkerchief. He searched. He raised his left arm and mopped his face with the handkerchief. handkerchief. His eyes still on Will. The odor from under his sweat-soaked arm made Will step back. 
Will held his breath until the fat man finished mopping his face. The fat man put his handkerchief away. He pulled the desk drawer open, and then he took his eyes off Will. He reached into the desk drawer and took out a bar of candy. He took the wrapper off the candy and threw the wrapper on the floor at Will's feet. He looked at Will, and he ate the candy. Will stood there and tried to keep his face straight. He kept telling himself, I'll take anything. I'll take anything to get it done. The fat man kept his eyes on Will and finished the candy. He took out his handkerchief and he wiped his mouth. He grinned. Then he put his handkerchief away. Charlie, the fat man turned to the little man. Yeah, Sam? He says he'd come to register. Sam, are you sure? Pretty sure, Charlie. Well, explain to him what it's about. The bony man still had not looked up. All right, Charlie, Sam said, and he looked up at Will. Boy, when folks come here, they intend to vote. So they register first. That's what I want to do, Will said. What's that? Say that again? That's what I want to do. Register and vote. The fat man turned his head to the voting man. Charlie? Yeah, Sam? He says, Charlie, this boy says he wants to register and vote. The bony man looked up from his desk for the first time. He looked at Sam, then both of them looked at Will. Will looked from one of them to the other, one to the other. It was hot, and he wanted to sit down. Anything. I'll take anything. The man called Charlie turned back to his work, and Sam swung his chair around until he faced Will. You got a job, he said. Yes, sir. Boy, you know what you're doing. Yes, sir. All right, Sam said. All right. Just then, Will heard the door open behind him, and someone came in. It was a man. How you all? How about registering? Sam smiled. Charlie looked up and smiled. Take care of you right away, Sam said. And then to Will, boy, wait outside. As Will went out, he heard Sam's voice. Take a seat, please. Take a seat. Have you fixed up in a little bit. Now, what's your name? Thanks, the man said. And Will heard the scrape of a chair. Will closed the door and went back to his bench. Anything. 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 I'll take it all. Pretty soon, the man came out smiling. Sam came out behind him, and he called Will and told him to come in. Will went in and stood before the desk. Sam told him he wanted to see his papers, discharge, high school diploma, birth certificate, social security card, and some other papers. Will had them all. He felt good when he handed them to Sam. You belong to any organization? No, sir. Pretty sure about that? Yes, sir. You ever heard of the 15th Amendment? Yes, sir. What does that one say? It's the one that says all citizens can vote. You like that, don't you, boy? Don't you? Yes, sir. I like them all. Sam's eyes got big. He slammed his right fist down on his desktop. I didn't ask you that. I asked you if you like the 15th Amendment. Now, if you can't answer my questions, I like it, Will put in and watched Sam catch his breath. Sam sat there looking up at Will. He opened up and closed his desk-pounding fist. His mouth hung open. Charlie? Yeah, Sam, not looking up. You hear that? Looking wide-eyed at Will. You hear that? I heard it, Sam. Will had, been, uh, Will had to work to keep his face straight. Boy, Sam said, you born in this town? You got my birth certificate right there in front of you. Yes, sir. You happy here? Yes, sir. You got nothing against the way things go around here? No, sir. Can you read? Yes, sir. Are you smart? No, sir. Uh, where did you get that suit? New York. New York, Sam asked and looked over at Charlie. Charlie's head was still down. Sam looked back at Will. Yes, sir, said Will. Boy, what you doing there? I got out of the army there. You believe in what them folks do in New York? I don't know what you mean. You know what I mean. Boy, you know good and well what I mean. You know how folks carry on in New York. You believe in that? No, sir, Will said slowly. You pretty sure about that? Yes, sir. What you what year did they make the 18th Amendment? 1870, said Will. Name a signer of the Declaration of Independence who became president. John Adams. 
Boy, what did you say? Sam's eyes were wide again. Will thought for a second. Then he said, John Adams. Sam's eyes got wider. He looked to Charlie to spoke and spoke to a bowed head. Now too much is too much. Then he turned back to Will. He didn't say anything to Will. He narrowed his eyes first, then spoke. Did you just, did you say just John Adams? Mr. John Adams, Will said, realizing his mistake. That's more like it, Sam smiled. Now why do you want to vote? I want to vote because it is my duty as an American citizen to vote. Ha! Sam said real loud. Ha! Again, and pushed back from his desk and turned to the bony man. Charlie? Yeah, Sam. Hear that? I heard Sam. Sam looked back, leaned back in his chair, keeping his eyes on Charlie. He locked his hands across his round stomach and sat there. Charlie? Yeah, Sam. Think you and Eleanor be coming over tonight? I don't know, Sam, said the bony man, not looking up. You know Elnora? Well, you, uh, you know about Elnora? Well, you welcome if you can. Don't know, Sam. You ought to if you do, if you can. Drop in if you can. Come on over and we'll split a corn whiskey. The bony man looked up. Now that's different, Sam. Thought it could be. Can't turn down corn if it's good. You know my corn. Sure do. I'll drag Elnora. I'll drag her hair by the hair if I have to. The bony man went back to work. Sam turned, turned his chair around to the desk. He opened a desk drawer and took out a package of cigarettes. He tore it open and put a cigarette in his mouth. He looked up at Will, then he lit the cigarette and took a long drag, and then he blew the smoke, very slowly, up towards Will's face. The smoke floated up towards Will's face. It came up in front of his eyes and nose and hung there. Then it danced and played around his face and disappeared. But Will didn't move. He was glad he hadn't been asked to sit down. You have a car? No, sir. Don't you have a job? Yes, sir. You like that job? Yes, sir. You like it, but you don't want it. What do you mean? Will asked. Don't get smart, boy, Sam asked, said wide-eyed. I'm asking the questions here. You understand that? Yes, sir. All right, all right. Be sure you do. I understand. You a communist? No, sir. What party do you vote for? I wouldn't go by parties. I read about the men and vote for a man, not a party. Ha! Sam said, and looked over at Charlie's bowed head. Ha! He said again, and turned back to Will. Boy, you pretty sure you can read? Yes, sir. All right, all right, we'll see about that. Sam took a book out of his desk and flipped some pages. He gave the book to Will. Read that aloud, he said. Yes, sir, Will said and began. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to this separation. Will cleared his throat and read on. He tried to be distinct with each syllable. He didn't need the book. He could have recited the whole thing without the book. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they... Wait a minute, boy, Sam said. Wait a minute. You believe that? You believe that, uh, that about created equal? Yes, sir, Will said, knowing that was the wrong answer. You really believe that? Yes, sir. Will couldn't make him say the answer Sam wanted to hear. Sam stuck out his right hand and Will put the book in it. Then Sam turned to the other man. Charlie? Yeah, Sam. Charlie, did you hear that? What was, this? what was it, Sam? The boy here, Charlie. He says he really believes it. Believes what, Sam? What are you talking about? This boy here believes that all men are created equal, like it says in the Declaration. Now, Sam, now you know that's not right. You know good and well that's not right. You heard him wrong. Ask him again, Sam. Ask him again, will ya? I didn't hear him wrong, Charlie, said Sam, and turned to Will. Did I, boy? Did I hear you wrong? No, sir. I didn't hear you wrong? No, sir. Sam turned to Charlie. Charlie? Yes, yeah, Sam. Charlie, you think that boy trying to be smart? Sam, I think he might be. Just might be. He looks like one of them that don't know his place. Sam narrowed his eyes. Boy, he said, you know your place? 
I don't know what you mean. Boy, you know good and well what I mean. What do you mean? Boy, who's Sam leaned forward on his desk, just asking, who, uh, just who's asking questions here? You are, sir. Charlie, you think he really is trying to be smart? Sam, I think you better ask him. Boy? Yes, sir. Boy, you trying to be smart with me? No, sir. Sam? Yes, Charlie. Sam, ask him if he thinks that he's trying to be good, and good as you and me. Now, Charlie, now you heard what he said about the declaration. Ask anyway, Sam. All right, Sam said. Boy, you think you're good as me and Mr. Charlie? No, sir, Will said. They smiled, and Charlie turned away. Will wanted to take off his jacket. It was hot, and he felt a drop of sweat roll down his right side. He pressed his arm against his side to wipe out the sweat. He thought he had it, but it rolled again, and he felt another drop come behind that one. He pressed his arm in again. It was no use. He gave up. How many stars did the first flag have? Thirteen. What's the name of the mayor of this town? Mr. Roger Philip Thorndike Jones. Spell Thorndike. Capital T. H-O-R-N-E-D-Y-K-E. -E. Thorndike. How long has he been mayor? Seventeen years. Who was the biggest hero in the war between the states? General Robert E. Lee. What does that E stand for? Edward. Think you're pretty smart, don't you? No, sir. Well, boy, you've been giving these answers too slow. I want them fast, understand? Fast. Yes, sir. What's your favorite song? Dixie. Will said and prayed Sam would not ask him to sing it. <laughs> Do you like your job? Yes, sir. What year did Arizona come into the States? 1912. Was, there was another state in 1912, New Mexico. It came in January and Arizona in February. You think you're smart, don't you? No, sir. Oh, yes, you do, boy. Well said, nothing. Boy, you know, you make good money on your job. I make enough. Oh, oh, you not satisfied with it. Yes, sir, I am. You don't act like it, boy. You know what? You don't act like it. What do you mean? You getting smart again, boy? Jesse is asking questions here. You, sir. That's right. That's right. The bony man made a noise with his lips and slammed his pencil down on the desk. He looked at Will, then at Sam. Sam, he said. Sam, you having trouble with that boy? Don't you let that boy give you no trouble now, Sam. Don't you do it. Charlie, Sam said. Now, Charlie, you know better than that. You know better. This boy know, here knows better than that, too. You know about that, Sam? You sure? I would better be sure if you think this boy here knows what's good for him. Does he know, Sam? Do you know, boy? Sam asked Will. Yes, sir. Charlie turned back to his work. Boy, Sam said, you sure you're not a member of any organization? Yes, sir, I am sure. Gather, he, Sam gathered up Will's papers, then he stacked them very neatly and placed them in the center of the desk. He took the cigarette out of his mouth and he put it out in the full ashtray. He booked up, picked up Will's papers and gave them to him. You've been in the Army, right? That right? Yes, sir. You served two years, that's right? Yes, sir. You have to do six years in the Reserve, that right? Yes, sir. You're in the Reserve now, that right? Yes, sir. You lied to me today, here today, that's right? No, sir. Boy, I said you lied to me here today, that right? No, sir. Oh, yes, you did, boy. You, oh, yes, you did. You told me you weren't part of any organization, that right? Yes, sir. Then you lied to me. Boy, you lied to me because you're in the Army Reserve, that right? Yes, sir. I'm in the Reserve, but I didn't think you meant that. I'm just in it, and I don't have to go to any meetings or anything like that. I thought you meant some sort of civilian organization. When you said you wasn't in an organization, that's a lie. Now, wasn't it, boy? He had Will there. When Sam had asked him about organizations, the first thing that popped in Will's mind had been the communists or something like them. Now, wasn't it a lie? No, sir. Sam narrowed his eyes. Will went on. No, sir. It wasn't a lie. There's nothing wrong with the Army Reserve. Everybody has to be in it. I'm not in it because I want to be in it. I know there's nothing wrong with it, Sam said. Point is, you lied to me here today. I didn't lie. I just didn't understand the question, Will said. You understood the question. Boy, you understood good and well, and you lied to me. Now, wasn't it a lie? No, sir. Boy, you gonna stand right there in front of me, big as anything, and tell me it wasn't a lie? Sam almost shouted. Now, wasn't it a lie? Yes, sir, Will said, and put his papers in his jacket pocket. You're right it was, Sam said. Sam pushed back from his desk. 
That's it, boy. You can't register. You don't qualify. Liars don't register. But that's it. Sam spat the words out and looked at Will hard for a second. And then he swung his chair around until he faced Charlie. Charlie? Yeah, Sam. Charlie, you want to go out and eat? Uh, you want to go out and eat first today? Will opened the door and went back out. As he walked down the stairs, he took off his jacket and his tie and opened his collar and rolled up his shirt sleeves. He stood on the courthouse steps and took a deep breath and heard a noise come from his throat as he breathed out and looked at the flag in the courtyard. The flag hung from its staff, still and quiet, the way he hated to see it, but it was still there, waiting, and he hoped that a little push from the right breeze would lift it and send it flying and waving and whipping from its staff, proud, the way he liked to see it. He took out a cigarette, and he lit it, and he took a slow, deep drag. He blew the smoke out. He saw the cigarette burning in his right hand, turned it toward, excuse me, turned it between his thumb and forefinger, made a face, and let the cigarette drop to the courtyard steps. He threw his jacket over his left shoulder and walked on down to the bus stop, swinging his arms. So that's called liars don't qualify. Obviously, the, the don't qualify to register, and obviously the lie was not a lie, but it was just that much. Um, they would the registrars would do would take anything to be able to keep a black person from voting. All right, that is by far the longest one, which is why I opened with it. The rest of these are much shorter. This one is called My Grandma's Stories by Willie Anderson of Carmel, Indiana. This is actually like a true story. This is in this is a um, this I, I got from a, a an interview. Growing up as a little boy in my native city of Gary, Indiana, I would often sit at my grandmother's knee and help her with my grandfather pick peas and clean fish. Sitting with my elders doing chores was a Saturday ritual where everybody would tell jokes and talk about politics and family issues. One Saturday afternoon, a news flash came over the radio about the 10th anniversary of the Freedom March in Washington, D.C. And just like that, everybody got real serious. I asked my grandparents to explain the Freedom March and why everyone's attitude suddenly changed. My grandmother was the first one to speak up. She said, well, baby, the Freedom March was a march that was organized by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other organizations so that black people could receive equal treatment. She stated that growing up in the South back in those days was a different time. Black people were treated with scorn and contempt. That's when I asked my grandmother what was her life like growing up in the South and whether she participated in the Civil Rights Movement. My grandmother, Mrs. Eloise Taylor, told me, told me about her role in the Civil Rights Movement. She was born in Uniontown, Alabama, and was raised in the Jim Crow era. My grandmother was denied a quality education, the basic rights of a human being. Her everyday lifestyle and the lifestyle of other African Americans were filled with fear and a sense of being considered a second-class citizen. She was determined at an early age to be treated with dignity and respect by her white neighbors, but because of current laws and sharecropping, she was forced to drop out of school. My gr grandmother moved to Gary, Indiana to avoid the drama in the South, only to find out that racism was being practiced in the northern states as well. She was determined to be a fighter in the second wind of the Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Movement had been fought in the United States since slavery was abolished, but the movement didn't get the full swing until Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus for a white patron. That act alone was the springboard that got national attention, not all the lynching, the firebombing, or the outright disrespect of an entire race of people. My grandmother was ready for action. She went back to her native Alabama and joined the Freedom Riders. One of the first marches she participated in was the Civil Rights March of Washington, D.C., where Dr. King delivered one of history's most famous speeches, the I Have a Dream speech. My grandmother got silent for a moment, and I could see, see the tears start to well up in her eyes. Then my mother told me that my grandmother would leave my mom and her siblings and my grandfather and ride down south with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the rest of the Freedom Riders to rallies, sit-ins, boycotts, marches, voter registration drives and funerals. My mother said that she and her siblings would watch the events on TV and sometimes they would be scared and cry. They would see the dogs biting the marchers and the police beating up people, beating on people. Life for my family was very hectic during those times because people were getting killed. My mother said she didn't know when or if my grandmother would lose her life for the struggle. My mother told me that whenever my grandmother would come home, she would tell them everything that happened and that what the news wouldn't 
or didn't show. My grandmother said that the march that she was most proud of was the Selma uh, was Selma to Montgomery march. She stated, "Oh, she stated that the march from Selma to Montgomery was like taking a breath of fresh air." My grandmother would cry with pride every time she would see news clips of the march. She said that march was the most important march in world history since the exodus from Egypt by our Hebrew ancestors. I asked her why that march was more important than the Civil Rights March on Washington, D.C. She looked at me and said with a sigh, Well, baby, the march on Washington was a peaceful march, whereas the Selma march was full of hardships. Many people, black and white, were beaten by the Klan and the police. Some people even lost their lives. She stated, The first march we tried was on a Sunday, and when we got to the Edmund Pettus Bridge, there was a wall of state troopers waiting for us on the other side. The police brutality was so bad that the news dubbed that day as Bloody Sunday. She said, I had never been so scared in my life. The police sicked the dogs on us and beat us senseless. My grandmother looked at the sky and said, Over 700 people were arrested for trying to participate in the nonviolent march. The only good thing that came out of Bloody Sunday was that the whole world got to see how the Alabama state troopers treated the protesters. That act of violence shifted the way people looked at the civil rights movement. She stated, It took us three attempts to finally march from Selma to Montgomery. We got a judge to give us the right to march. We can only march during the day, we can only have 300 marchers on the highway at any given time, at any given time, and by the third attempt to march, there were 25,000 people in attendance. I could tell that even though she was proud of what the marchers achieved, she was still saddened at how they were treated. But there was a light at the end of the tunnel, and she heard it when Dr. King delivered the speech, How long? Not long. She said because of the way they treated us, President Lyndon B. Johnson met with Governor George Wallace in Washington to talk to him about the civil rights situation in the state. They couldn't come to an agreement, so President Johnson passed the Voting Rights Act, which was Kennedy, as we discussed in the last lecture. I would watch the news clips and try to see if I could spot my grandmother. Watching the news clips was very intense. I often wondered how people could treat each other like that. Because of Dr. King, the Washington, D.C., and Selma marches and what they represented, I participated in the Million Man March years later. I could never fully understand how my grandmother felt when she marched on Washington, D.C. and Selma. But I understand her quest for freedom and equality. These are the things I, leaned, I learned sitting at my grandmother's knee. All right, so our first... I love that one. Our first... Um, secret word is Sonic the Hedgehog. This one is called Elementary Schools and the KKK by Joyce Russell Terrell. In 1961, I integrated Garfield High School in Woodbridge, located in Prince William County, Virginia. My father, Reverend James P. Russell, was the president of the NAACP. Roy Wilkins selected attorney Sterling uh, Sterling Tucker to represent me at a hearing in Richmond because I had been denied admittance to the all-white high school. I was 13 and had seen the Little Rock film clips over and over and was afraid for my life. This is a county where the KKK reigned supreme and where the first battle of the Civil War was fat, fought in Manassas. I was denied admittance to the school and I was relieved. Weeks later, while looking at the news, the reporter made the announcement that the ruling was overturned and that I would be integrated in the previously all-white school. That night, the Klan shot up our house. Little did they know that Daddy had a small arsenal in his closet. He ran around the house and returned fire, shot for shot. By morning, Bobby Kennedy sent the federal marshals to advise me to get out of the area until school started. My dad drove me to our family homestead in North Carolina. He, bought, he brought copies of the Washington Post, which included articles of the integration, and put them in the local all-white stores, I think to prove a point that he was a man and not a boy. Two nights later, a huge cross was burned across the road. That moment was the end of my childhood. On the first day of school, my mother drove, and police cars were in front of me and behind me. When I arrived at the school, the whole student body was standing outside, and the media had been told to leave, and there went, there went my Ruby Bridges picture for historical purposes. I reluctantly walked into the front door as the students moved back so I could get through. 
At the main entrance, Principal Herbert Saunders said, Welcome to Garfield High School. I walked through those doors and a hell began that no child should experience. I stepped out of that car, a colored girl, and arrived inside that building, a young black woman. My sister Deborah and brother Cameron integrated a Quokin uh, Elementary School, and brother Jimmy Russell integrated Fred Lynn Middle, Middle School. My father, James P. Russell, single-handedly with his children, desegregated the school system in Woodbridge in spite of threats, numerous hate calls, and the KKK. I hated the horrid experience of integrating alone and have carried this with me all my life. At this time, I feel that I did my part so that we now have an African-American man as president of the United States of America. Yes, I integrated a high school alone and felt that if I could do it, I could do anything. There are thousands of civil rights stories, and mine is one of them. God bless you. Obviously, this was written when Obama was president. This one is Assassination Attempts, written by Don Sanders. My father was the first African-American person to register and vote in Haywood County, Tennessee, since Reconstruction. There were three attempts on his life by the local chapter of the Ku Klux Klan. During one of the assassination attempts, he was seriously injured. His injury was the result of a Klan member attempting to run him off the road. My father's vehicle was struck from behind, and he was thrown from the vehicle and left for dead in a cotton field. The ambulance driver discovered he was not, during, not dead during the transport and brought him to our home and dumped him on the front porch. The local hospital refused treatment, and my father had, be, had to be taken by my mother to Jackson, which was 25 miles from where we lived. During another assassination attempt, a bomb was placed under our home, which blew three rooms away. My parents received minor injuries, as well as one of my brothers. During the third assassination attempt, the Klan discovered my father who often slept overnight in his, at his place of business to pretend, prevent damage to his property. My father on occasion would sleep in the gar garage behind his place of business, rather than on the premises. He would dress a cot on the premises of the business and pillow, with pillows and blankets to give the impression he was sleeping there overnight. On one occasion, my mother received a late night phone call informing her that her... Now, okay, I'm going to pause. I do not and will never use the N-word, so anytime the N-word does come up, I'm going to reference it as that. Uh, on one occasion, my mother received a late night phone call informing her that her, her N-word husband had been killed and she needed to come and get the body. When I arrived at my father's place of business with my mother and two of my brothers, we approached a bullet-ridden cot and assumed my father was dead. When one of my brothers removed the blanket, we broke down in tears. My father appeared several minutes later. During the course of my father's involvement in the civil rights movement during the 1960s, I witnessed Klansmen burning crosses in our yard on several occasions. We received death threats and lived in constant fear of the Klan appearing during the middle of the night and taking my father to an isolated area and lynching him. The courage, perseverance, and wisdom that my father demonstrated were truly unbelievable. I never saw anxiety or fear in his demeanor. On one occasion, the, Mar the, Rev excuse me, on one occasion, the Reverend Martin Luther King appeared at our home for a meeting. As a ten-year-old child, I was unaware of the significance of his presence and what he would mean to the future of the civil rights movement in his country, in this country. Even though my father had dropped out of school in the third grade, he became a member of the County Board of Education, became local president of the NAACP chapter, and, run, and ran un, unsuccessfully for sheriff. My father inspired me to stand up for, an injust, for injustice and become a servant of the people. As a clinical social worker, I have used the ideals and philosophy of my father's commitment to civil rights to address the needs of individuals in our society that are less fortunate. Jet Magazine did an article on my father in the spring of 1966 to highlight his involvement in the civil rights movement in western Tennessee. This one is called... Oh. This one's called Easter Weekend. So I forgot to change the, the title when I copied this. So this one's called Easter Weekend. The room is packed. People are hugging each other and laughing. I can see how happy they are to see each other. I'm at the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee's Spring Conference. I've come to the conference because I want to volunteer for the Mississippi Summer Project. SNCC is recruiting students to go to Mississippi 
to work in voter registration and to freedom schools. I am here to learn more about Mississippi. People are coming onto the stage. They are men and women, former and current members of the Freedom Singers. They lead us in singing. Then one of them shouts, What do you want? We yell, Freedom! When do you want it? Now! What do you want? Freedom! When do you want it? Now! The room goes wild. We are clamping, clapping. We are stomping our feet. We are yelling, Freedom! Now! The room quiets. The chairman of SNCC comes to the podium. It is John Lewis. Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests and my fellow warriors for freedom, he begins. It is the hope of all of us that this conference will have some deep meaning for each of you. It is the fourth spring conference of the Students' Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and John reminds us of SNCC's founding in Raleigh, South Carolina in 1961, and of the freedom rides, sit-ins, and community struggles that have taken place. Then he turns to Mississippi and begins to talk about the conditions in Mississippi. People have been killed. He talks about the congressmen and senators. In 1964, all but one of the representatives and senators from, Washington, from Mississippi had been in Washington for 20 years that one of them has only been in Congress for 16 years. Since congressmen get power on committees according to how long they've been in Congress, Mississippi congressmen are some of the most powerful people in Washington. John reads descriptions of two lynchings that happened earlier in this, in this century. Both occurred in Senator Eastland's district. In the first, it is Senator Eastland's father who leads the mob and determines how the couple, a man and a woman, will be tortured and then murdered. The mob cut out chunks of flesh with a corkscrew before burning the man and woman. He then goes on to read of a lynching that happened less than 20 miles from Senator Eastland's home. The mob burns this man slowly. It is horrible. The whites are so cruel, they are so sick. They cut off pieces of the man for souvenirs. Most do it after he dies, but one cuts off his ears while he is still alive. My mother and father believe ours is a good country. Yet I am sitting here listening to how Senator Eastland's father was a murderer. He was never tried or punished for the torture and lynching of that man and woman. I am hearing that Senator Eastland did nothing about other lynchings. I am hearing that Senator Eastland is chairman of the Judiciary Committee and probably the single most powerful person in Washington. How can this be a good country of this man, given what he represents is the leader of our government? I can barely hear John as he continues. I am overwhelmed with the horror. I know there were lynchings, but I had never heard that women were lynched as well as men. I didn't know that people were cut up before being hung or burned. I didn't know that white people took chunks of flesh as souvenirs. I feel alone, so alone. I look down at my white hands. Then as John finishes his talk, I hear him say, Today in 1964, is this, in the state of Mississippi, you have a Negro voting population of more than 400,000. If they could vote, Senators Eastland, Stennis, and their counterparts in the House would be put out to pasture, and the biggest roadblock in the way of progressive legislation would be removed. That, I think, would be worth dying for. The Freedom Singers came back on the stage, and we began singing. We sing songs of freedom and struggle. We sing of courage, courage and hope. We sing all the rest of the night. When we sing NSCC's theme song, We Shall Overcome, we stand clasping hands, singing and swaying back and forth to the music. We are one living, breathing, hopeful group of men and women. When we sing the first Black and White Together, we sing, I don't know the, the melody, Black and White Together, Black and White Together, Black and White Together, Now and we raise our hands above our heads, and, and I look and see there are brown and black and white hand cla cla hands clasped together. I am no longer alone. Our second secret code is Mario. A bonkers story about Lucille Tyne. Lucille Times just wanted to get some dry cleaning done. She ended up a major part of forgotten United States history. Countless people stood up, marched, and res resisted during the Civil Rights Movement. This is the story of one such woman so fed up with the BS that decided to do something about it. 
and the end is absolutely bonkers. It's June 15, 1955. Lucille Times, a 33-year-old black woman living in Montgomery, Alabama, drove her Buick LeSabre to the dry cleaners. All the way, a Montgomery Municipal bus driver attempted to run her off the road. Not once, not twice, but three separate times. The bus driver got angry and tried to run me off the road and into a ditch, Times told Troy Daly, a newspaper. After the third attempt, attempt, Times pulled over. She hoped the bus would pass and she could carry on. Instead, the bus driver pulled up behind her and got out. Times got out of her car, too. The, time, the driver and Times had a heated altercation, exchanging expletives. She says the confrontation even got physical at one point, so the bus driver called the police. When they arrived on the scene, the Montgomery p police were of little help to Times. They didn't arrest her, but after nearly killing her, the bus driver went unpunished. Steaming mad and frustrated, Times called the city transportation department. The city never returned her call. Fed up, Times went to the president of, the, of her NAACP unit. She wanted to start a bus boycott. The president, Edie Nixon, was a well-known union leader, strategist, and activist. He already had an idea for a bus boycott in the works and was looking for the perfect sympathetic plaintiff to be the face of the movement. As empathetic to the cause as he was, he suggested Times wait to begin the boycott until after Thanksgiving so the city would lose out on fares from holiday shoppers. But that timeline didn't suit Times, a veteran organizer herself, so Time decided to go at it alone. She started her boycott the next day. Times got in her car and drove around the city. When she saw black people at a bus stop, she offered to pick them up and take them to their destination. She was one woman in a Buick, so the impact was relatively small, but her purpose and passion were undeniable. Soon, a few other friends and neighbors were joining her in the help. Their boycott went on for nearly six months. Cut to December 1st, 1955. Edie Nixon had finally found the perfect plaintiff for a potential bus boycott. She was a seamstress and NAACP secretary trained in civil disobedience. <clears throat> Rosa Parks. <clears throat> it literally says to read that, by the way. <laughs> After Thanksgiving, as planned, she sat down in the front of Montgomery bus and refused to move. Parks' refusal and subsequent arrest triggered the official launch of the Montgomery bus boycott. E.D. Nixon got on the phone to find ministers and senior leaders in the church to help lead the effort. One person he called was Martin Luther King Jr. The rest of that story is 381 days of courage, grit, and United States history. But wait, there's more. And it's so, so good. The driver of Rosa Parks' bus was James Blake the very same bus driver who tried to run Lucille Times off the road less than six months earlier. Wild, right? After the official launch of the Mus Montgomery bus boycott, Times continued to give rides to people in need. She se stepped up to serve in several capacities throughout the civil rights movement, providing space for organizers at the cafe she owned with her husband, as well as opening their home to, the un to NAACP meetings. She even marched the entire route from Selma to Montgomery, hosting 18 other marchers of all backgrounds at her home. But when Rosa Parks and Claudette Colvin made history books, Lucille Times is rarely mentioned. However, the state of Alabama listed the Times' as home in the Alabama Registry of Landmarks and Heritage in 2007, and a large marker stands there today, which is in the image. Lucille Times is still alive and in her mid-90s. Not too shabby for a woman who just wanted to pick up her dry cleaner. Now, I just realized, too, I forgot to change the title on this one, and I forgot to change the title on the next one. So, I am sorry that the titles are wrong, and, I mean, I could pause real quick, but I'd have to do some research. So, just, um, this one is a, I'm almost positive this one's about MLK, which is trying to remember. Every year at this time, it is all around us. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. equals civil rights, and civil rights equals black people. Because of this limited view, we misunderstand what Reverend King stood for, and why he died. The 1957 founding motto of, motto of Reverend King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference was to save the soul of America. 
and by 1967, 10 years later, he had undergone a sea change in his understanding of what that meant. That it involves not just wrongs to black people in the United States, but of economic inequality of all people, and the maiming and murdering and poisoning of distant, innocent people in our testing of modern weapons of warfare. On April 4th, 1967, a year to the day before he, he was murdered, he gave a political speech at Riverside Church in New York. It was a detailed and explicit call for an end to the immoral Vietnam War. To his former colleague, colleagues who, as a result, disowned him as no longer a civil rights leader, he responded, The time comes when silence is betrayal. On April 4th, 1968, Against the advice of some advisors, he was in Mississippi to support a sanitation worker's strike, emblematic of the campaign he was a short time away from leading. A half million strong poor people's campaign heading to Washington to camp in a tent city and to press the government to address income inequality. We now know that the United States government was panicked at the thought of a situation it couldn't control in the capital that might spread unrest ac across the country. The dangerous Reverend King had to go. The rest of the story we think we know, but the commonly held belief was false, as, he re as was revealed during a little covered month-long civil trial held in Memphis in late 1999. You can read about it in An Act of State, The Execution of Martin Luther King, a stunning book by William Pepper, the lawyer who gathered evidence over two decades and was hired by the King family to litigate the trial. At the trial, the jurors heard from nearly 70 witnesses who were among or had direct personal knowledge of the large number of people in, involved in Reverend King's execution. After less than an hour of deliberation, the jury found, and the judge agreed, that James Earl Ray, the accused lone, lone, lone gunman, was an unwitting patsy, uninvolved in the murder. Who did the jury find to have been involved? Supported by a mountain of evidence, they conclude that Reverend King was executed by a conspiracy involving, among others, officials and the members of the Memphis Police Department, the state of Tennessee, the mob, the FBI, the Justice Department, and even the United States Army. The full story of what happened that day is complex and horrifying, and it explains why we are taught by textbooks and mass media that Reverend King was only about black people's civil rights. There are too many skeletons in that closet. The only media person attending the entire trial was a local anchorman who, convinced by the evidence, was threatened and eventually fired. The only coverage consisted of attacks by people who weren't present and heard none of the evidence. Reverend King wasn't only about black civil rights. He was about the soul of America. And by ignoring that, we may have gone a long way toward losing that very soul. And finally, um, so this is about, uh, uh, there was a movie just made about this. In fact, let me, let me pause this so I can at least get you the title. Give me one second. All right, so the movie was called Hidden Figures, and that's what this story is in reference to. As America stood on the brink of, the, of a second world war, the push for aeronautical advancement grew ever greater, spurring an insatiable demand for mathematicians. Women were the solution. Ushered into the Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory in 1935 to shoulder the burden of number crunching, they acted as human computers, freeing the engineers of hand calculations in the decades before the digital age. Sharp and successful, the female population in Langley skyrocketed. Many of those computers were finally getting their due. But conspicuously missing from the story of female achievements are the efforts contributed by courageous African-American women. Called the West Computers after the area in which they were relegated, they helped blaze a trail for mathematicians and engineers of all races and genders to follow. Quote, These women were both ordinary and they were extraordinary, says Margot Lee Shetterly. Her new book, Hidden Figures, of which the movie is, referenced, uh, is made after, shines light on the inner details of these women's lives and accomplishments. The book's film adaptation, starring Octavia Spencer and Teresia uh, P. Henson, is now open in theaters. It's now on DVD. So I highly recommend renting it, by the way. It's such a great story. And you guys know I'm a total space nerd, so I love this kind of stuff. Quote, we've had astronauts. We've had engineers. John Glenn, Gene Kranz, Chris Kraft, she says. 
those guys have all had their have all told their stories. Now it's the women's turn. Growing up in Hampton, Virginia in the 1970s, Shetterly lived just miles away from Langley. Built in 1917, this research complex was the headquarters for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, which was intended to turn the floundering flying gadgets of the day into war machines. The agency was dissolved in 1958 to be replaced with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, as the space race gained speed. The West, the West computers were at the heart of the center's advancement. They worked through equations that described every function of the plane, running the numbers often with no sense of the greater mission of the project. They com contributed to the ever-changing design of a menagerie of wartime flying machines, making them faster, safer, safer, more aerodynamic. Eventually, their stellar work allowed some to leave the computing pool for specific jobs. Christine Darden worked, in, worked to advance supersonic flight. Katherine Johnson calculated the trajectories for the Mercury and Apollo missions. NASA dissolved the remaining few human computers in the 1970s as the technological advancements made their roles obsolete. The first black commuter computers didn't set foot at Langley until the 1940s. Though the pressing needs of war were great, racial discrimination remained strong, and few jobs existed for African Americans, regardless of gender. That was until 1941, when A. Philip Randolph, pioneering civil rights activist, proposed a march on Washington, D.C. to draw attention to the continued injustices of racial discrimination. With the threat of 100,000 people swarming to the Capitol, President, President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802, preventing racial discrimination in hiring for federal and war-related work. This order also cleared the way of the black computers, slide roll in hand, to make their way into NACA history. Exactly how many women computers worked at NACA, and later NASA, over the years is still unknown. One 1992 study estimated the total topped several hundred, but other estimates, including Shutterly's own institution, says that number is in the thousands. As a child, Shutterly knew these brilliant mathematicians as her Girl Scout troop leaders, Sunday school teachers, next-door neighbors, and as parents of schoolmates. Her father worked at Langley as well, starting in 1964 as an engineering intern and becoming a well-respected climate scientist. They were just part of a vibrant community of people, and everybody had their jobs, she says. And those were their jobs, working at NASA Langley. Surrounding, surrounded by the West computers and other academics, it took decades for Shetterly to realize the magnitude of the women's work. It wasn't until my husband, who was, uh, who was not from Hampton, was listening to my dad talk about some of these women and the things that they have done that I realized, she says, that way is not necessarily the norm. The spark of curiosity ignited Shetterly, uh, who began researching these women. Unlike the male engineers, few of these women were acknowledged in academic publications or for their work on various projects. Even more problematic was that the careers of the West computers were often more fleeting than those of the white men. Social customers of the era dictate social customs of the era dictated that as soon as marriage or children arrived, these women would retire and become full-time homemakers, Shutterly explains. Many only remained in Langley for a few years. But the more Shutterly dug, the more computers she discovered. Quote, My investigation began, became more like an obsession, she writes in her book. I would walk away... I would walk away any trail if it meant finding a trace... Oh, I would walk any trail if it meant finding a trace of one of the computers at its end. She scoured telephone directories, local newspapers, employee newsletters, and the NASA archives to add to her growing list of names. She also chased down stray memos, obituaries, wedding announcements, and more for any hint of the richness of these women's lives. It was a lot of connecting the dots, she says. I got emails all the time from people whose grandmothers or mothers worked there, she said. Just today, I got an email from a woman asking if I was still searching for computers. She had worked at Langley from July 1951 through August 1957. Langley was not just a laboratory of science and engineering. Quote, in many ways, it was a racial relations laboratory, a gender relations laboratory, Shetterly says. The researchers came from across America, 
Many came from parts of the country sympathetic to the nascent civil rights movements, said Scheiderly, and backed the progressive ideals of expanded freedoms for black citizens and women. The phenomenal true story of the black women mathematicians at NASA whose calculations helped fuel some of America's greatest achievements in space. But life at Langley wasn't just the churn of greased gears. Not only were the women rarely provided the same opportunities and titles as their male co counterparts, but the West computers lived with constant reminders that they were second-class citizens. In the book, Shatterly highlights one particular incident involving an offensive sign in the dining room bearing the designation, Colored Computers. One particularly brazen computer, Miriam Mann, took responding to the affront on, on as, took responding to the affront on as a as a her own personal vendetta. She plucked the sign from the table, tucking it away in her purse. When the sign returned, she removed it again. That was incredible courage, says Shetterly. This was still a time when people are lynched, when you could be pulled off the bus for sitting in the wrong seat. There were very, very high stakes. But eventually, man won. The sign disappeared. The women fought many more of these seemingly small battles against separate bathrooms and restricted access to meetings. It was these small battles and daily minutia that Shatterly strove to capture in her book. And outside of the workplace, they faced many more problems, including segregated buses and dilapidated schools. Many struggled to find housing in Hampton. The white computers could live in Anne, Wynne Hall, uh, Anne With Hall, a dormitory that helped el uh, alleviate the shortage of housing. But the black computers were left to their own devices. By the way, I'm going to just pause for a quick second. The third and final secret code is Crash Bandicoot. Quote, History is the sum total of what all of us do on a daily basis, says Shetterly. We think of capital H history as being these huge figures, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and Martin Luther King. Even so, she explains, quote, You go to bed at night, you wake up the next morning, and then yesterday is history. These small actions in some ways are more important or certainly as important as the individual actions by these towering figures. The book and movie don't mark the end of Shadowly's work. She continues to collect these names, hoping to eventually make the list available online. She hopes to find the many names that have been sifted out over the years and document the respective life's work. The few West computers whose names have been remembered have become nearly myth mythical figures, a side effect of, a, of the few African-American names celebrated in mainstream history, Shetterly argues. She hopes her work pays tribute to these women by bringing details of their life's work to light. Quote, not just mythology, mythology, but the actual facts, she says. Because, quote, the facts are truly spectacular. All right, y'all. So... It, you know, I said this was going to be a little bit shorter and it ended up being an hour. Um, so thank you for listening through. I, I hope you know, like I obviously as a history background and I actually have an English background. I love reading short stories. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I sounded okay. Um, I feel like I started out very rough with that first story in terms of my ability to present the story. But I feel like I've kind of improved as I go along, which is, you know, what happens. Um... I hope you enjoyed it. These are just some civil rights stories that you don't normally get. This final story about the the black female mathematicians working for NACA and NASA is obviously more popular culture now because of the movie, but that movie wasn't, you know, a blockbuster, so most of us probably have never even seen it. Um, although I do recommend watching this. Certainly not homework, but again, we've got the time. Uh, the rest of these stories, have, you know, really were stories that you never heard. The first one was a short story, but what it did is it illustrated what life was like for blacks as they were attempting to earn, to, to sign up to vote. A simple process and a constitutional process. And so, you, you know, you kind of felt like this guy was going to see it through, this guy was going to see it through, he was going to see it through. And then in the end, he was still blocked. Um, and that happened all the time for decades and decades. The rest of these are obviously all short stories that we just never heard. They're not taught, which is why I love to teach them, because they go beyond the pages of the textbook. So, again, I hope you enjoy it. Um, I should have said off the top, you probably could treat this as a podcast because the pictures were meaningless. Uh, well, they weren't meaningless. They represented the story, but the pictures weren't necessary for the story. Um, so hopefully you did treat this as a podcast and, and really you know, got a lot out of it. So again, there are no um, what say use with this. Although, 
Well, I will just ask, what was your favorite story? It's not a white say you per se, but just what was your favorite story? Um, and then give the three secret words. Um, you guys, be safe out there. Stay, stay safe. Whatever state you're in, just make sure that you're washing your hands. You're wiping everything down when you go outside. You wash your your groceries. Whatever. Just make sure. I literally, I literally washed a box. It was sealed, but I washed a box because of the way a guy handled it in the store just yesterday. It felt silly, but it, right now it felt necessary. Um, so just be safe. You know I love you all, and I always will. Um, the next week's lectures will be up hopefully by Monday and then, well, absolutely, the first lecture will be up by Monday, but then hopefully both of them will be up by Monday, if not Monday, and then Tuesday. Um, other than that, once again, I love you all. Peace.